everyone, and thanks for joining us today. I'm Greg Murray, Editor-in-Chief of Politics and Life Sciences, and we're here for our next uh, PLS Authors presentation. You should note that this event is being recorded and will be distributed on social media and the journal's YouTube channel, as we were just discussing. Today, we're going to hear from Dr. Jordan Manziel and him, him talk about his PLS article, Ideology and Social Cognition, are liberals and conservatives differentially affected by social cues about group inequality? I have put a link to the paper in the chat for those of you who might want to access it, and I'll try to do it a couple more times during the presentation if I can. About, about Jordan, Dr. Manziel is a postdoctoral associate at the Network for Economic and Social Trends at Western University, Canada. His areas of research are political ideology, political biology, and political psychology with a focus on the motivations and decision-making of ideological actors. Using an experimental approach, Dr. Manziel's research aims to understand how biological and evolutionary influences, excuse me, processes influence the ideological spectrum. And of course, this, this article is part of that interesting research agenda. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. And thank you, Jordan, for sharing your research with us in Jordan. I will say the floor, or I guess in this case, the screen is yours. Yeah, the internet is mine. Uh, well, good morning. Uh, thank you all uh, to all of you for coming. Uh, take some time out of your Friday morning. Uh, thanks to Greg and the Journal of Politics and Life Sciences for inviting me to present. Um, as mentioned, I'm gonna present a paper that's in, you know, issue 39.1 of Politics and Life Science, Ideology and Social Cognition, you know, Our Labels of Conservatives differenti Differentially Affected by Social Truths About Group Inequality. Um, just to repeat my introduction, so I'm Dr. Mitzel uh, at the Western University Network of Economic and Social Trends. I'm also affiliated uh, with the University of Quebec at Montreal in, in the, the political psychology and you know, political communications lab there. Um, just a little bit further, so I'm interested in co-variations in ideology and social environmental behaviors. Uh, I'm also interested in the regulation of emotion and attitude formation, as well as the nature of self-concept relationship with political attitudes. Um, so um, I'm going to give a very simple presentation today, um, but that's to say is I also encourage anyone to ask for clarifications and questions during the Q&A. Um, as a general overview, this is an experimental study. Uh, it focuses on behavioral variation in ideological groups. It's going to use an economic game, which is a public goods, and this economic game is going to include uh, an inequality manipulation. And then and more generally, the paper is going to apply an evolutionary perspective to understanding ideology and ideological variation. Um, so I'm going to think about ideologies and ideological orientations as dispositions. These dispositions in general we can be conceived as sort of alternative strategies uh, to interact with the social environment. That is to say is they offer different utilities under different environmental conditions. Um, you know, in terms of the literature, I mean, I, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail given the audience, but I think we, we sort of all recognize that there's there is a, is a large amount of literature which establishes an association between ideologies and variations and psychological characteristics and physiological characteristics. Um, these include dispositions, um, heritability studies and gene studies, um, neurophysiology, both in terms of activation and in the volume of key cognitive regions, as well as variation in personality. Um, and from, an, from an evolutionary perspective, the presence of heritable variations is interesting. Typically, this it's often indicated that something has been selected on or has an adaptive function. Um, what's, what's further interesting is that a lot of the variation associated with ideological orientations concerns things like information processing, information categorization, and behavioral updating. So we're, certainly we're all familiar with the studies demonstrating that there's, in terms of neurophysiology, a tendency for, for liberals to be more reflective, to engage in, in cognitive updating and behavioral updating as well as a tendency for conservative individuals to be more conservative for stability as well, stability, um, but also with you know, vigilance to the external environment as well as you know, threats from the external environment. Um, all this together sort of raises a sort of interesting question about what, what do ideologies do, if anything? And so the motivation of, the, of this, this paper and some of my larger research is really to test this sort of question, you know, um, to investigate, is there some underlying behavior utility uh, to ideological variation. Uh, and the second sort of primary motivation is, is to ask this in a way that considers whether or how this utility relates to the content of ideology. So the kinds of attitudes, beliefs, and values that these groups might seem to profess. 
Um, the secondary motivation, which is, which is the framing of, of this particular piece is, you know, what do liberal ideologies do, if anything? Um, you know, we're all sort of aware of the, the correlation between orientation, sort of this, use the language of John Jost, intolerance towards inequality. And anecdotally, this is often characterized as sort of being, you know, a tendency towards altruism and generosity, fairness behavior. Um, this may not be the case, obviously, but in general, there's a characterization of liberals as having some sort of positive pro-social motivation. And so I'm, I'm quite interested to see if in this paper, does this actually pan out? Um, are, are liberals sort of fair and generous as they claim? Um, there is a previous study which, which addressed this by Anderson, Nello, and Meyer. Um, I, would, I would claim this is a bit of an indirect manipulation for, for a couple of reasons that I won't get into now. So I wanted to look at that paper and see if I could do a more robust and, and direct assessment. So the main question of the paper is, do individuals with different attitudes to inequality display, display behavioral differences under unequal conditions? Uh, and the second question is, is, do these individuals respond to rectification of these inequalities? So very quickly, I'm gonna use an experiment. Uh, it's a public goods game with the inequality manipulation. I'm gonna randomly assign groups of pe uh, people to groups of six. Each person is going to receive 20 tokens. Um, they're, going to they're going to be able to contribute between zero and 20 tokens to that public good. Any contribution to the public good will be multiplied in value by 1.5. Any tokens retained will retain the value of one. Um, after the multiplication of tokens, these tokens will be divided equally amongst all members of the group, so they'll be divided by six. Uh, and what's important to understand here is that the payout for this game is going to be based on the number of tokens earned, and the participants are going to receive real, real money uh, in the rest dollars. Um, Okay, so it's a bit of a complicated treatment manipulation, so I'm gonna focus on this. In my control treatment, every individual in the game is going to earn 10 cents per token, and that's fixed. And it's um, in the, the manipulation treatments, which are treatments two to seven, roughly defined in the paper, we're gonna randomly assign people to a different payout value. They can earn a low payout, which is seven cents, and they can earn a high, or they can earn a high payout, which is 13 cents per token. During the public goods game, half of your group is going to be assigned to that low value, and half of your group is going to be assigned to that high, high value. Um, so what, it, what is, that's to say is that the actual treatment consists of matched pairs. Individuals uh, are going to, in groups two and three, will be playing together, four and six and five and seven. And just for clarification before I go into the details, participants are aware that individuals in their group um, will receive different value per token. This is going to be important for them for understanding the manipulation, what we're trying to get at. Okay, so in, two, in treatments two and three, right? Half the group gets a high payment, half the group gets a low payment. That is just a fact of the game. Um, the game starts, they see that, and the game plays out. In treatment six and seven, these are individuals who are assigned to the high payout, so initially assigned to earn 13 cents per token. We give, the, give them the option to redistribute, to vote to distribute those tokens, so that everyone in the group receives 11 cents per token. Instead of that, just so instead of that split in distribution between 13 and 7, everyone will now earn 11 cents per token. And the idea is that voting or deciding to make that distribution comes at a personal cost. Um, for clarification purposes, treatment six in the results is going to is going to encapsulate everyone who voted yes to that decision, and treatment seven is everyone who voted no. And if, if, if that isn't quite clear, you can think of people are randomly assigned to treatment six and seven as one thing, and then I split them up afterwards based on that decision. So Assignment to treatment six and seven might be random, but whether or not they're in six or seven is a non-random act. It's based on their decision making, right? So that, that's meaningful for our results later. We don't want to report them quite the same way. Um, uh, treatments four and five um, are, are low payout conditions. Um, so in treatment four, individuals are, are assigned to receive the low payout. Initially, they're told they receive the low payout, but then they're told that their counterparts, the individuals in treatment six, voted to change the nature of that payout structure. In treatment five, the opposite is essentially happening. They're assigned to the low, the low payout condition, and then they're told that their counterparts had the option to redistribute and chose not to. So then just a reminder again, two and three is playing together, four and six, five and seven. So treatments four and six have an, have an equal pay per token. Treatments five and seven have an unequal pay based on a decision-making outcome, right? Okay. so. Expectations, general expectations first. In treatments two and three, I'm not expecting to see a, a difference in contributions. And the principal reason is why it's random and the participants know it's random. They're told prior to the game, there's gonna to be an equal unequal payout. It's nothing to do with you, right? 
And so because it has nothing to do with the participants or the participants in that group, I don't expect to see a big behavioral outcome. Um, for hypothesis one, you know, the expectation is that contributions by liberals when we're assigned to that low payout condition will increase in response to pro-social cue, the decision to redistribute payouts uh, by other members of their public goods group, right? Um, second hypothesis, so I'll clarify. So this is really based on the literature, and we talked about this in the paper, about the decision-making updating, the behavior update being the processing of emotion that occurs. It differentiates these liberal and conservative ideological groups. Um, so the second hypothesis then is that this change in liberals in response to this process of Q should be larger or in excess of what it must be observed for conservatives. And then the third hypothesis is that in the contributions of conservatives in response to being assigned to the low payout, and to learning that other members of the group chose not to redistribute it to an equal payout, uh, we'll see a decrease, a corresponding decrease in contribution. And I'll, I'll note finally that I have no specific hypothesis or expectation for about what liberals should do in, in, in treatment five, but we can talk about the outcome. Uh, general, uh, the sample, we use an online sample. It's uh, 1,245 observations from Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, the mean age is 35. Um, ideology is based on the Wilson Patterson Index going from negative 21 to positive 21. So this is a series of single issue item measures as opposed to symbolic ideology. Uh, the score in the sample is from negative 19 to positive 16. So the sample is, is, is you know, slightly more liberal than it is conservative, which isn't surprising for an online study. Um, I've recoded this into a categorical measure. And for some people that might be a bit odd, but we can talk about the justification for that you know, in the Q&A section. Uh, but they're all alternative codings in the appendix, including the continuous measure. And then in general, we're left with about 631 liberals and 416 conservatives. Okay, I'm gonna begin just going right into the results. So hypothesis one, are we gonna see an increase in contributions for liberals in response to a pro-social cue as treatment four? We do, uh, we can reject the null for this. So it's about 2.6 units from, from, from 20 uh, in terms of standard behavior for an economic game. This is a fairly large effect. Um, you know, it's more, much more common to see increases of, of, of one and, and less than two units. Um, hypothesis two, does, does this effect for liberals exceed that of concern? So this table, you know, captures the difference between the two groups. And we see that there is a very large difference that on average, liberals contributed, you know, 3.4 more tokens in this treatment than conservatives did, uh, which is a very large effect. Um, again, and hypothesis three, um, do we see a, a corresponding decrease in contributions uh, by conservatives in response to treatment five, you know, learning that your, your counterparts in your group decided not to redistribute the payouts. And in fact, yes, we see this effect. Again, it's a fairly large effect. It's about 3.1 tokens, um, and it's just a little significant. Um, really quickly, in terms of our expected outcomes. So as expected, we don't see a difference in contributions uh, for treatments two and three. Um, some additional results worth mentioning is we didn't state a hypothesis for the liberals in treatment five, but we do see that their, that their um, pardon me, the contributions do decrease and it is just still significant. Uh, and finally, what's important here is we see no difference in, in the decrease in liberals and conservatives between that treatment, or pardon me, pardon me. Uh, we don't see a difference between liberals and conservatives in the decisions redistributed. So when we go back to individuals who are assigned to treatment six and treatment seven, and we ask them, do they want to redistribute their, their high payout for an equal payout, liberals and conservatives do this at approximately the same, same rate or same proportion of the population. Um, you know, conclusion, so you know, observe differences between ideological groups. Um, yeah, there are differences um, between these groups. There's in response to a pro-social cue, the redistribution of decision of other group members to redistribute payout, liberals do see uh, an increase in boost in their contribution. Um, but this doesn't really reflect um, generosity or fairness, as we have seen in treatment two and three, there's no general difference here. Um, really quickly, I'll, I'll make a note about the literature. So when this study was run, there was very few papers that looked at the behavioral differences between liberals and conservatives, specifically in the context of an economic game. So there was one paper by Anderson, uh, Miller, and Milo, 2005, and sort of an indirect paper by, by Alfred and Hibben. Um, there's also a number of papers that look at sort of pro-social behavior and group behavior among, among partisans. And a number of papers have suggested this is the same thing. And I, I just wanna emphasize, this is probably not the same thing in part because their partisan IDs are often disclosed in these studies. And so they're, they're, they're aware they're interacting with individuals in different groups. 
Um, what is important is there's recently been several papers which seem to replicate the effect here and the effect they have in other studies. So this, this piece is a piece by Thompson et al. I have a previous party, which is previous piece, which is in, in apples. Um, a recent piece in political behavior by Gunridge and Ruder, which has just come out. There's also a forthcoming piece by Scott Classens, who's in New Zealand, who does, who's ministered, I think up to a dozen economic games and seems to find consistent results. And I also have a replication study with Michael Bank Peterson, which is, which is forthcoming, which seems to find the same kind of behavior using the right Christian dilemma. So overall, all the, the effect seems to hold. Uh, with the possible exception of the Thompson paper. There's some, some slights of differences were observed. Um, so that was very quick. Um, that was generally the focus of the paper. Uh, I'm really happy to take any questions and to clarify anything that was unclear. Thank you so much, Jordan. It was very interesting. I remember when I made my final read of this, working my way through, it's very interesting. It's a very interesting, sophisticated paper. All right, so I'll open the floor to folks who might be interested in asking questions. Does anybody have any questions for Jordan? I have a question. Okay, Carter, there, go, ahead. go ahead. Yeah, you can, you can go ahead and see me. Um, so Jordan, do you expect any, any biases uh, coming from the fact that you're using an online study? I know you mentioned that there were more liberals signed up than conservatives. How did you, how did you deal with that? Um, so, yeah. So for this particular study, they deal with it directly. No. So we generally do expect some biases. It's in the, it's in the conclusion of the paper, but you know we do find that people who who are conservative or identify conservative in online samples are not necessarily as conservative as some of the other members of the population, or at least they don't generalize well to sort of the whole gambit of, of, of traits. So in, in this study, it's not directly controlled for. I, I will add though, in a future study. When, what I did was I make a specific attempt to, to balance demographics across liberals and conservatives. So balancing education, balancing on age, balancing on sex, um, those kinds of traits. Um, I will say as, as perhaps a simple proxy, the sample was drawn from a larger sample of several thousand individuals. It's tried to get as close to balancing those things as possible, but I, I don't think I quite get there. Okay, thank you. That answers, thank you. But so there is a chat question from Patrick. So he says, what are the policy implications that you see for this? What are the policy implications? So I often think about this in the context of past political campaigns and the tone of past political campaigns that focus on positive framing versus negative framing. And in this paper, and I would, I would argue across other aspects of the literature, there does seem to be a suggestion that liberals tend to be respond to or are more motivated by you know, positive tones, positive messages, positive things. So in terms of policy implication, you know, highlighting the positive motivational aspects of something might be meaningful for, posit for, for, for policy development or positive, I mean, policy framing. Um, so from more of a marketing perspective, you're saying? From a marketing perspective, I mean, so if we go back to the question that sort of Anderson Mill and Meyer raised, about are liberals more socially aren't are they more generous are they more fair um i don't think that holds i think what we see is that they have a tendency towards certain kind of environmental conditions perhaps environmental conditions that move boundaries um or which attempts to address ambiguities and uncertainties in a, in a sort of pro-social manner but in terms of policy framing conditions like what policy you're going to you know propose I mean, ultimately, the for the fact that these two, if I'm, if, if I'm right, if the literature is correct, that these groups do respond, I live those in conservative market individuals, respond to very different kinds of conditions. I don't yeah. know if that's easily responded to in a, in a single policy, because, you know, directing a policy towards grun group may be biased its reception by Yeah. Does, I mean, do your result, I'm sorry, I'm going to jump in since I've got my mic on still. So do your, do your, does this have anything to do with virtue signaling? Could it be that liberals are more sensitive to virtue signaling than conservatives? Okay, so this, this piece comes out of, of, of my, my larger body of work in my doctoral dissertation. And the suggestion is, is that, that I see, at least what the evidence I see, is not that it's virtual signal by liberals. It's that general, liberals are applying a pro-social strategy. That is, they're just generally open to, to engage in cooperation, 
They see cooperation as a positive benefit and are interested in removing obstacles to population. So present with an opportunity to engage in a professional activity, their default is to say yes. Um, I tend to think of virtual signaling as being most associated with conservative orientation because they have this greater concern for normative violations and threat. And so in that context, virtual signaling isn't necessarily about which is about signaling and telling people others that I am not a threat. I'm reliable. I'm doing the following things. We have the following norms in the, in the population. They tell us we should do the following things. I'm an example of someone who follows the norms. I follow the rules. I can be trustworthy. And you can imagine in a population of individuals who are highly sensitive to threat, you know, the lack of a clear signal would be would be meaningful complication. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that makes sense. Can you see the chat? Alex asked a question. Can you see the chat? I should probably read it. Here, let me read it and then what you think about it. How, so this is from Alex. How would you expect your results to be affected by manipulating what participants know about group composition? For example, would you expect similar behavior from liberals and conservatives if they are in a group with co-ideologues versus an ideological outgroup? For instance, people may perceive non-cooperation differently if it's by an in-group versus out-group member. It's a very interesting question. I've tried to do this in a study using variations in, in normative perceptions and it ended up being very, very messy. Um, in general, what I found though, is that there, when individuals shared a, a similar norm, I found a similar effect in liberals that they showed a greater increase in, in cooperativeness and prosociality. Um, and again, I found a larger effect related to when the group did not share a similar norm amongst conservatives. So conservatives were, were less likely to engage in Social behavior, especially when it was considered to be a normal violation. Uh, so, from the first standpoint, I would expect the behaviors to generalize when there's disagreement amongst the group. I would expect uh, conservatives to be more sensitive to threat and liberals to be more prosocial. But if we're manipulating, if we're manipulating ideological factors, and so we know the members of the group are, let me read that question more time. So my other paper with apples does something similar. We manipulate the value distance between individuals. And again, when individuals show a strong similarity in values, there was a big uptick in behavior from liberals. This wasn't observed in conservatives. Um, if I take the next reading of the, of the question is, when we're aware in a mixed group when we see, and we see violations, is this treated as a greater level of non-compliance? That's a good question. Um, composition. You, with co-ideologues versus ideological. You know, so again, I, I, I'm going to summarize again. I apologize for the delay. I would expect if they're in a group in which there's not um, clear coherence or agreement about a norm, I expect a larger decrease or lower levels of prosociality amongst conservatives. When the group has a high level of coherence, I expect greater prosociality in the circles. That's what my expectation would be. Yeah. He says, thanks. <laughs> thanks for your question, Alex. Um, while we're waiting for other questions, I want to ask you, I'm always interested in variable payouts in these public good games. So how did you, how did you determine your payouts? You had payouts from 7 to 13 cents. How did you end up with that? structure so i mean this is this is less interesting but part of it was just the money available for for the study um 10 cents is not uncommon for a payout in the public goods game especially if there's multiple iterations um so i wanted to work around 10 cents the tricky part became is where we manipulate the high and the low payout yeah. um and ultimately from a standpoint of having enough power i wanted enough people to agree to distribute those payments and accept that cost so I needed, the, I needed the 13 cent value to decrease some, but if it decreased too much, if it went all the way down to say below 10 cents, I would be concerned that people wouldn't make that decision. And because we're using a strategy method, I actually need participants to decide that you know, accepting that cost was a positive outcome. Um, but beyond that, you know, the 10 cent value was based on previous studies. Um, it, it does vary quite a lot. There is some suggestions that higher payout values do result in higher levels of contribution. Um, but yeah, so based on previous literature. It was, so what was the structure? Seven, 10, and 13? That's right. What it was? Yeah. And then a the redistribution to 11 cents. Yeah. 
quality condition. Right, 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 right. Okay. All right. I think that's interesting. All right. Even though you said other people may not find that's interesting, I think that's interesting. Um, let's see. You'd also mentioned you recoded your, I think you said your, re, your ideology variable to a categorical variable, and you said there was something behind that decision. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So having done a number of studies looking at you know, behavior of liberals conserves during economic games is there's this question of what do people in the middle of the spectrum do? You obviously want to we tend to treat ideology as a continuous measure. When I look at the outcomes of individuals at the center of that measure, I've, I frequently observe that they don't necessarily do, do something that clearly defines them as being on a continuous spectrum. They often do what liberals do in one condition or what conservatives do in another condition. And so treating them in the, so if we're thinking of these in terms of a disposition, that is if, we, if liberals have a disposition towards prosocial and conservatives have a disposition towards say, be concerned about threat or vigilance, the behaviors of the neutral individuals often approximates both groups. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's almost a flexible strategy. Um, I think this creates, so in other words, neutral, so if liberals are doing one thing, they're being pro-social, conservatives are being, let's say, risk givers. The strategy of neutral individuals is better encapsulated as, as a third alternative, right? Um, so that's, that's the motivation behind it. Um, did your so, results vary by how it was coded? Um, the significance varies a little bit. Um, I, I mean, there are alternative codings in, in the appendix. The effect does hold. Yeah. Um, but it's a question of if, if we're trying to understand, you know, the underlying dimension of ideological orientation, and if we think there's a reasonable argument for disposition, which I'm going to claim that there is, um, you know, is it just a tipping point when it's, is it, on a continuous measure? Just suddenly we become more and more and more and more like this. But when we look at it, when you look at papers of cognition, physiology, and decision-making, it's often not such a gray gradation. It's often very cut and dry. Um, and so from my perspective, I often characterize people who are neutral as applying that third strategy, their flexible strategy types. Um, their strategy is more pliant for different conditions. Maybe it's not optimal, so maybe they don't cooperate quite as much as someone who's liberal oriented they're not quite as sensitive, sensitive to threat as somebody's conservative. With a combination of those two things in, in a way that we're not observing the other groups might really differentiate them as a strategy. Yeah, okay. Uh, and Patrick asks, did you consider, I'm sorry, did you consider different conceptualizations of liberalism, conservatism to two dimensions, social and economic, for instance? So this particular measure so at one point we recode the, the, the score in the Wilson-Patterson index to focus on questions which have an economic or, or an economic or inequality orientation and the, and the effect holds there. Uh, in, this, in this piece, I think I've administered the Wilson-Patterson index. And I think it'd be administered either a liberal conservative or a left-right scale. And the effect seems to hold there as well. Um, in follow-up studies, I, I took this question on much more directly. So in, that, in a follow-up study, we administered seven measures of ideological orientation. They measured the effect across all seven measures and that effect held. But in this study, it's not something we control for. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I should, it's also worth noting that most studies that look at ideology only administer one measure. Yeah. Uh, and it's something that needs to be addressed in future studies is, is adding multiple measures, looking at the covariances, um, looking at the effects that hold across all of the all dimensions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Patrick said, thanks. All right, let's see, we have any other questions for Jordan? All right, seeing none, I think. Jordan, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, in general, um, this is an ongoing area of research for me. So if anyone has any questions, comments, concerns about what needs to be addressed in future studies, uh, I'd love to hear them. So please share those comments with me directly via email. Uh, look me up. Uh, I'm happy to chat with them. All right, thank you. Thanks, Jordan. Thank you again. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. And um, actually, I will... I will uh, chat where this will end up just so you guys can see it. Let me throw that in there real quick. So you got it. I think that went. And um, thank you all. Take care and stay safe. Thanks, Jordan. Thank you very much. Take care.